lakes. These powerful hunters have prowled the oceans for 400 million years. And yet many have gone almost unnoticed, making their homes in the world's iciest waters. Underwater camerawoman Christina Karlicek embarks on an international expedition to find just a few of the more than 100 species of cold water sharks. Elusive species that have rarely been filmed before, before it's too late. Despite their finely tuned survival skills, sharks are under severe pressure, tangled in fishing gear by the hundreds of millions. In order to save them, we must understand them. But first, we must find them. Night embraces the frigid waters of Northern Europe. And beneath, a new life stirs. Safely anchored in its egg case, the young predator prepares. Here, on the continental slopes of Europe, small spotted cat sharks reign, perfectly camouflaged and equipped to strike at night. The baby cat shark has been growing in the egg for eight to 15 months now. Mothers continue to hunt and will never return to their little ones. The 10 centimeter shark must fend for itself. Which means finding a good hiding place. The cold waters of Western Sweden fall within the small spotted cat sharks territory. The plunging coast creates canyon like fjords 560 meters deep linked to the Atlantic. The meter-long cat sharks share these waters with other cold water sharks, dogfish. When the summer sun heats the surface water, fish, including sharks, rise from the deep to feed. Kristina Karlicek is thrilled to start a dive expedition near her Swedish home. I've filmed great white sharks and tropical sharks before, but I'm eager to investigate the secretive cold water sharks that are my neighbors. About 100 species prowl the cooler waters worldwide, and we know so little about them. She's joined by marine biologist Klaas Melmberg. Klaas works with a group that monitors Swedish shark populations. Now, they hope to find small spotted cat sharks, though these top predators have become extremely rare here. Klaas and Christina install fixed cameras to be their eyes when they have to return to the surface.
It's a 200 meter drop off. They choose a good vantage point at around 30 meters. The fatty fish bait creates an attractive chemical lure. Up to two thirds of a shark's brain is dedicated to smell. But even after a few days, they find no trace of a shark. I'm quite disappointed to, to not find sharks, even though I knew it was going to be very difficult. This is an apex predator. It's a predator that should react to uh, all the fish bait we have put out, and still we haven't found anything. They aren't giving up. But right now, there's a shark event in Norway that Christina does not want to miss. The further north she goes, the cooler it gets. Glaciers continue to shape this land. The powerful Atlantic drift pushes nutrient-rich currents northwards along the coast. It also puts divers at the mercy of rough seas. Sharks usually pass here just a few weeks each year, and Christina knows it will be a challenge to film them. She's on board with Norwegian marine biologist, Frederick Muir. They're out to find spiny dogfish sharks. Majestic forests of kelp ripple along the upper continental slopes withstanding winter water temperatures of three degrees Celsius. It makes a perfect hideout and feeding ground for small marine animals. Though large predators come here too, like the meter long spiny dogfish. Normally, they live far deeper, migrating the oceans. But this elusive shark is not alone. Dogfish are gathering by the hundreds. These sharks troll the cool and temperate oceans, but are notoriously hard to find. It's Christina's lucky day. My heart just skips a beat. I never thought I'd actually see that many sharks in Scandinavia, where often people don't even know they exist. While Christina focuses on filming, the sharks move in very close. Frederick Murr has observed the spiny dogfish for almost a decade and tries to figure out why they come here. Volunteers through his organization Save the Sharks of the Seas guard the sharks at this site every year.
They've only seen them eat bait, but never hunt. Perhaps they don't come here for the food. Maybe they gather to avoid becoming food, hiding from larger sharks. They're well protected though, with venomous spikes on their dorsal fins. Or maybe it's a nursing ground. Unlike cat sharks, dogfish give birth to live young. Most of the dogfish here are females, and some are visibly pregnant. Their two-year gestation is the longest among sharks. The kelp forest may provide dogfish daycare, sheltering the babies. Even though spiny dogfish are the world's most abundant shark, they're still in danger. Clustered together, the pregnant sharks get scooped up in large numbers by fishing nets. Around the world, more than 200 sharks across all species are killed every minute. 50% or more of all captured animals in the Northeast Atlantic are considered bycatch. Sharks don't often survive being thrown back to sea. This net belongs to a scientific vessel that uses commercial trawling methods. Pollution and overfishing are a boon to jellyfish. The crew is working to find a use for them while reducing shark bycatch. Frederick's shark organization promotes sustainable fishing methods and a more selective technology. The trick is getting more people to use them. You have to use smart hooks. Uh, it's a technology quite simple. It has, uh, it has a metal alloy uh, along the, the hook that actually prevents or at least uh, reduces the amount of sharks biting on the hooks. And it doesn't affect the bony fish at all because they don't have the same sensory system as the sharks do. Frederick and his organization have reduced overfishing spiny dogfish at this crucial breeding site. The news isn't as optimistic back in Sweden. Christina and Klaas return there to check their camera traps for any signs of sharks. Cat sharks should have discovered the bait by now. During their dives, Class notes the water is unusually cool for the season and depth. Whether temperature change or fishing bycatch is the culprit, the fish seems surprisingly scarce below the warm top layer. On the way up, Class discovers a tiny creature. A member of the nudie branch family. Flabellina lineata gathers food from the toxic tentacles of a flower-like hydroid. The nudie branch is immune to the venom, which keeps predators away. Every creature tells a story. Some of these nudie branches shouldn't be so plentiful here this season. The water must be abnormally cold. One of these ones that is, uh, is feeding on the hydroid. Days go by and still no signs of sharks. 
But what's this? No, seal. It's a seal. Right. Yeah. You see? Yeah. Nice move, but oh, come closer, please. I would have uh, expected the seal to go straight up to the bait box and check it out. It's, uh, it's strange we don't get it yeah. to come closer. It's, even the seal is very skittish. Yeah. Mm. Mm. That's how it is. Yeah. Something may have disturbed this area. The team might need to face the sad possibility that the sharks are gone. We fish a lot and they, they go as a bycatch and uh, the problem with sharks is that they, they grow slow, they mature slow and they get few youngsters. So it's very easy actually to, to, to wipe them out. The good thing is that uh, we have uh, stopped fishing them in our waters. Small spotted cat sharks get a helping hand in the aquarium Habitshus, or House of the Seas. They'll release nearly all the young sharks in hopes of boosting the local population. Marine biologist Martin Sternstead and Christina don't want to miss the moment of their release. First, the youngsters get a checkup. The little hunters are part of a long-term study, staying in captivity for about three years until they've grown to some 40 centimeters. The dorsal fin gets tagged. If the shark is ever seen again, the marker will help to track its movement along the coast. To protect these understudied hunters, we need to learn more about their life in the wild. This is the point. This is why we do it, is to release these sharks. So it's definitely mostly fun to see them go away and hopefully have a, a good life and a long life. Over a hundred sharks have already been released into the wild since 2003. Shark lovers have come from far and wide to celebrate this special day. The biggest success might be getting Sweden's sharks into the hearts and heads of the people. The aquarium team has prepared the sharks for this day since birth. Now, the little sharks must depend on their strong survival instincts. When they are five years old, they'll look for mates and help to sustain the population. But first, the youngsters have to get used to their exotic new home in the deep, cold waters. Elsewhere in the North Sea, biologists are trying to learn more about the largest shark to spend months in this area. A rocky island towers out of the shallow North Sea. Heligoland. In the summer, when water temperatures rise to 17 degrees Celsius, the local cat sharks get some company. Fisheries biologist, Dr. Matthias Schaba, 
is one of the first to use large-scale satellite tracking to monitor North Sea sharks. Taupe sharks gather in the shallow waters around the island for months. Matthias wants to know if the same sharks keep returning and where they go when they leave. Local fishing legend Michael Janka is taking Matthias to his best spot. Matthias has five satellite tags to attach before the shark season is over. Generally, very little is known about this shark species. Just because they're not picked up through standard data collection of scientific research vessels, this shark is too fast to be caught with a trawl net. All hopes are on the skipper. He's one of the best anglers, catching sharks around the island for over 30 years. Unless you're specifically looking for taupe sharks, you're never going to see one, except in aquaria. Definitely not while swimming, snorkeling or diving. Taupe sharks are powerful long-distance swimmers. Are any close enough to detect the lure? Something big took the bait. Now, it's up to the skipper and crew. Oh, it's very loose. Matthias, left side. Matthias, links from here. Pass off. The shark might free itself from the hook and beware those jaws and teeth. To calm the shark down, a kitchen towel does the job. Matthias has less than six minutes before he must return the shark to the water. The satellite tag will collect data about ambient light, water temperature, and depth. After 270 days, it will pop to the surface and transmit its data to Matthias. Two minutes to go. He secures a tissue sample for genetic study of this one meter 60 long shark. it can resume its journey. Taupe sharks migrate thousands of kilometers to a secret destination. But Matthias is starting to figure it out. We already got a few data points from last year. One tag surfaced earlier than expected, but delivered spectacular findings. Just after the release, the animal left the North Sea for the English Channel and then swam 3,600 kilometers to Madeira, where the tag surfaced. Matthias was surprised to learn that this shark preferred to live and hunt in the cold waters around 700 meters deep once it reached the continental shelf. Further north, the Hebrides are a hidden hotspot for another migratory cold water shark, the second largest fish on Earth. I'm so thrilled for this chance to find this massive shark, a cousin of the white sharks. Fingers crossed for good visibility underwater. Christina and Scottish marine biologist Shane Wasick keep their eyes open for a telltale fin. There's no time to lose. Go, 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 nice and quiet. But it's only an ocean sunfish with a fin that mimics the giant that Christina is looking for. 
Ocean sunfish eat mostly jellyfish, which ride the nutrient-rich currents. Where there's food, there should be sharks. They'll keep looking. An upwelling from the Atlantic abyss hits the coast, where the summer sun kicks off enormous algae blooms. Wind and waves concentrate the phytoplankton like a thick soup. Perfect grazing for armadas of zooplankton. One of the most common is the tiny copepod, Colanus. And finally, here it is, the basking shark. Ten meters long, slurping down its favorite food. The shark has no competition here. Good thing, because it must filter 2,000 tons of water per hour to fill its belly. The up to four ton shark burns enormous energy to swim against the current with its mouth wide open. But it knows where it's going following the scent trail of the plankton as it feeds. Up close, basking sharks can even identify larger copepods within the swarms to gobble down. These giants carefully avoid obstacles. Christina dives without scuba gear to avoid spooking the Leviathan. But she can film for only as long as she can hold her breath. The shark spends just 10% of its time at the surface. This is just what I love about filming underwater because the scene opens up once you're under the surface. And that's only when you see the whole dimension of the shark and its behavior. She appreciates the shark's plight even more. I'm so overwhelmed filming the shark so close. But I'm also concerned about their future because their food is changing so drastically over the last decades. Sampling the prey helps gauge the health of the basking sharks and the ocean itself. Plankton are already struggling from the climate crisis and pollution in the North Atlantic. Colonist populations, a key link in the food web, have changed and moved further north. Sharks swim great distances searching for the best copepod areas. But a shark's gotta do what a shark's gotta do. Plankton brings them together at the surface. Few people encounter the sharks as often as Shane on his daily trips as tour guide and researcher. Uh, bass and sharks are very understudied as a species, so a lot of the stuff that we're doing is, you know, new behaviours that people are seeing, and, uh, you know, this is the biggest uh, aggregation of them in the world, so, um, yeah, we've, we've got a really good opportunity, but it's all just right at the start. Scientists recently discovered that the sharks return regularly to restaurant spots and bring their kin. And a hearty meal might be a recipe for shark-style romance. As autumn comes, the sharks and the plankton will descend again to the cold mid and deep layers of the Atlantic. Back to the fjords of Norway. Though they're shallower than the open ocean, their lower layers remain a chilly seven degrees Celsius all year. Mm -hmm. 
Many deep water species thrive here in the dark and quiet depths. Cold water sharks included. It's too deep to dive. That's where the submersible drone comes in. It's my chance to see the velvet belly lantern shark in its natural deep water habitat. It's one of over a hundred cold water sharks that researchers have just recently begun studying. Underwater drone pilot and shark enthusiast Jonas Falsa was fortunate to have spotted this tiny predator in the fjord. At 90 meters, the team discovers their first resident. Nice. Yeah, there's the chimera. Is it feeding? Chimeras are ancient relatives of the sharks. This one is busy hunting small crustaceans, unconcerned by the drone. To navigate in the pitch darkness, the chimera has a remarkable sense of smell and exceptional vision. Though it still bumps into things. Whoa, oh, it was fast. fast. He did not like that. <laughs> Even after multiple dives, the team cannot find any sharks. The day ends with sagging spirits and drained batteries. But their hope for finding lantern sharks hasn't entirely dimmed. Norway's magical winter months always provide a bright spot. Rare sightings of the lantern sharks at even shallower depths could give another chance for Christina. Filming in total darkness is really tricky because we only get to see what comes into the shine of our light. And we're after something that's swimming extremely fast and is small. Shooting at night in icy waters needs careful planning and real determination. To find the lantern shark, they must push down to at least 30 meters. Suddenly, a fish takes interest in the filming lights. It's a European hake. This sharp-toothed fish can grow to 140 centimeters, twice the length of a lantern shark. Close to the seabed, the team must watch their own fins. Stirring up the sediments could wreck their filming. Suddenly, patience and good fortune pay off. The velvet belly lantern shark, typically found only at much greater depths of 200 to 2,000 meters, has come into the range of the lights. It's an extraordinary chance to see this 25 centimeter shark. This is overwhelming. Finding this little shark was literally a shot in the dark. What strikes me is that it swims unmistakably shark-like. Even though it's such a dwarf compared to a white shark, it's clearly a mini predator.
But the creatures down here also have a secret that they hide from the lights of the cameras and reveal only in total darkness. Like something from a fairy tale, sea pen corals flash when touched to scare off predators. Nature's own luminescence, barely visible to our eyes, can be captured only with low light cameras. and gives the velvet belly lantern shark its chance to shine. Its glowing stomach, visible only in a specialized setup, has never been filmed before. Even with sensitive cameras, the glow is hard to capture. But there's more here than meets the eye. The lantern shark has been enlightening Professor Jérôme Malefet and his team for years. They have something special which attracts me, of course. They are luminous, so they can produce their own light, what is called bioluminescence. And we started 10 years ago, nothing was known on their bioluminescence, nearly nothing. Catching sharks from the shallower Norwegian fjord is less stressful for the fish than hauling them up from the deeper oceans. Jérôme brings his catch to the dark lab. As a physiologist, I want to know how the light was produced. Most of the fish are producing light under nervous control. And the first, really, really first problem we encountered was none of the known neurotransmitters were triggering light. So we had to search a bit further away, and we ended testing hormones. That was the first surprise and the first ever described fish having a hormonal control. Jérôme usually works in total darkness. He hypnotizes the sharks by touching a spot on the nose, the ampullae of Lorenzini. Tiny organs on the belly begin to glow. From below, they act as camouflage, mimicking distant sun or moonlight through the water. This shark is, is a MacGyver user of light because he's able to conceal his silhouette by using the light from the belly and so disappearing in the darkness of the ocean. The spine is highlighting a weapon, so stating aposematic use Okay, don't bite me, I will puncture you. Jérôme and his team also found the velvet belly lantern shark uses light to signal to its peers. He is certain it has more secrets to uncover. But an even more mysterious cold water shark prowls the northern seas. The camera traps of Canadian scientist Dr. Bryn Devine capture candid moments of life at 700 meters. An ancient predator trolling the blackness. It's a Greenland shark. After a bite to eat, it looks lethargic. But this predator is quick enough to snag a seal.
I can't wait to get to Greenland to find one of these impressive sharks. This is the Greenland shark's front door. They are the only sharks that can live under the polar ice. Temperatures are crushingly harsh and food scarce. Christina and her German team hope to find the trail of the Greenland sharks. Local fishermen often catch or spot them, even in the shallows. They double check their gear before heading out. But the weather cancels the expedition. It's not too cold, but too warm. The soft snow can't support a snowmobile, stranding the team in the town of Tassilak. If they want to dive, they'll have to walk. They're heading to a site that could attract Greenland sharks near the ice flow in the bay. is absolutely marvelous to experience. It's a shark's world. Normally, humans would die if in this cold water too long. We can only do this with special equipment and training. Eventually, the divers reach a shallow seabed. The locals have mentioned a graveyard of whale bones here. Hungry Greenland sharks could be patrolling for carrion. Today, small animals, like little aliens, claim the territory. After almost an hour in these freezing waters, Christina and her team reluctantly retreat. Faces and fingers get too cold. The formations down there are just incredible. But we're actually still on the search for the only shark that can live under the ice. The melting period intensifies over the next weeks. Spring has come one month earlier than usual. The breaking sea ice is opening new channels. Tobias Ignatjusson is first to have his boat back in the water. He has been hunting and fishing since he was 14.
Greenland sharks are a part of his life, sometimes as bycatch when he fishes for halibut. Although the meat is considered toxic, drying or fermenting makes it safe. We go hunting for sharks when we need to, any time of the year. Before, it was very common food. But now, not many eat the shark. Christina joins Tobias fishing. He is about to raise the long lines that he put out earlier. The team is happy to be back on the water. But the dense drift ice looks ominous. Plus, a storm is forecast for the end of the day. Tobias takes them where the outer fjord connects to the abyss of the Greenland Sea. Greenland sharks have been caught here before. Fortunately, the wind hasn't closed the ice passage. Christina and the team prepare to enter the icy water on a moment's notice. But pulling up the long line can't be rushed. Tobias senses he's caught something big. Greenland sharks can be up to six meters long. Christina can't wait. She wants to know what's on the hook. Yes, it's a Greenland shark. It's an extraordinary catch for Tobias. Since the shark's no longer a food fish, he releases it. A naturally slow swimmer, the shark doesn't rush off. Christina has only a vague idea how it will react to her. Just thrilling and absolutely mind-blowing to meet this animal. These predators often carry a parasite on their eye, which doesn't seem to affect them. In fact, the eye might function as a light sensor, and the shark may depend more on smell and electroreception than vision to catch prey. The stubby dorsal fin is specially shaped for swimming under ice. For millions of years, their excellent adaptations have made Greenland sharks the rulers of these waters. Even in extreme conditions, this shark could live 300 years or more. But nowadays, only few have the chance to become this ancient. The Arctic is changing drastically. It's hard staying calm facing such a magnificent animal. I just wish I could keep swimming along to find out more. 
What I learned is that we people have the power to really help sharks, but we have to act now. Natural born survivors for millions of years, cold water sharks face a chilling future. Only if we truly commit to keeping the oceans healthy, can we continue to share this planet with creatures as amazing as the sharks of the icy north.